Good evening everyone. Today our topic of discussion is quite a neglected topic that is the osteoporosis which we every almost we encounter in every patient particularly in the geriatric group but unfortunately we hardly treat it because very recent days until very recent days there is very much dilemma as well as misconception on this particular topic. Why so? Because we are not certain when to treat, how to treat and how many days is need to be treated. So let's start osteoporosis with recent advances. What are the recent advancements in the treatment? Osteoporosis is a disease which is characterized by low bone density. Deterioration of the bone tissue, disrupted bone microarchitecture, compromised bone strength and fracture. So here you can see the bone tissues are get deteriorated and bone density is almost lost. And with time, it going close and also. So osteoporosis is mostly two types: primary osteoporosis and secondary osteoporosis. And regarding primary osteoporosis is type 1 and type 2. And what is the diagnostic criteria of osteoporosis? WHO shows that the bone mineral density is measured in a standard deviation for an young adult as a reference population where T score is 1, minus 1 or above. But when there is a loss of bone mass, it shows between minus 1 to 2.5, minus 2.5. And it is called osteoporosis when the bone mineral density, bone mineral density is around less than 2.5. And most of the time, after 70 years in a postmenopausal woman, it can be less than even minus 4. So here lies the standard deviation measurement of the diagnostic criteria by WHO. And what are the clinical criteria of osteoporosis? One is incident fracture. Fracture can be in the weight bearing areas, particularly in the hip, vertebra, forearm fracture which is consistent with osteoporosis, collis fracture in hand and hip and vertebra fracture and frac score, T score between minus 1 to minus 2.5 at the femoral leg, total hip tensor scan by accompanied by frax projected 10 year risk, more than 3% of the hip fracture or more than 20% of the major osteoporotic related fracture that is vertebra, hip, forearm or proximal humeral based on the US adapted FRAX model. So this is the main diagnostic criteria which is placed by WHO to diagnose osteoporosis. We usually do a DEXA scan to measure in the T-score and if the T-score is between minus 1 to 2.5, minus 2.5 we used to tell is an osteopenia and osteoporosis is less than minus 2.5. Now, we have discussed the primary osteoporosis and secondary osteoporosis in our previous slide. So, primary osteoporosis is mostly type 1 and type 2. Primary means where the cause is not known. Mostly it happens with the menopausal women. At the same time, it happens with senile osteoporosis. So, it is caused by the loss of the tabular bone due to lack of estrogen in case of female. And in case cytokines, interleukin 1, interleukin 6 that leads to the increased osteoclastic activity. We know osteoclast is a bony resorptive molecule cell and osteoclast is bone proliferative cell. And type 2 is a senile osteoporosis which is a loss of cortical and trabecular bone in both men and women. Here you can see the type 1 is only in case of women because of the lack of estrogen but senile osteoporosis happens to both men and women Remodeling efficiency is there, insufficiency is there, dietary inadequacy particularly in terms of calcium, vitamin D and other protein. So muscle mass as well as bone get compromised and age related activation of the parathyroid axis. Parathyroid we know increases calcium in the blood circulation and increases bone resorption. So increased activity of the parathyroid leads to type 2 or senile osteoporosis. Now comes to the secondary osteoporosis, it will be many. Let's see the remodeling and cycle and bone resorption first, then we will go to the secondary osteoporosis. So
So here is a bone. Bone there is a multiple things happens at a time. One is activation, one is resorption, one is reversal, one is formation. These are things are going on. Osteoblast and osteoclast both are present simultaneously in the bone. And osteoclastic activity is determined by the RAN. We will come to the RAN because the RAN molecule is very important in our today's discussion. On the other hand, this MCSF, these all inflammatory cytokines we have already discussed about interleukin 1 and 6, these are also responsible. On the other hand, one hormone which is basically vitamin D, it's uh, synthesized in the skin from 7 dehydroxy aldosterol to the calcium trial and then calcium trial ultimately forms vitamin D3 in the liver and then comes to the kidney to form 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol so one hydroxylation happens at the skin and one hydroxylation happens at kidney that all leads to the activity of the osteoclast which helps in bone formation and increases or prevents rather osteoporosis on the other hand parathormone having osteoclastic activity along with that there is that RAN ligand which increases bone resorption. So this things continues in a bone every day and every night, even every minute. But when there is a discrepancy or there is a difference between the remodeling and resorption, there comes the osteopenia and osteoporosis. When this osteoclastic activity is more than the osteoblastic activity, there comes the problem of osteopenia and osteoporosis. So here is a lot of number of lists showing the secondary osteoporosis but mostly lifestyle factors like alcohol, excessive thinness, excess of vitamin A, fragmented falling, frequent falling, high salt intake immobilization, these are all lifestyle factors, vitamin D deficiency is again smoking, some genetic factors like cystic fibrosis, the RDH group, enlarged downloads, gauchas, this so children, even in a low compatible less age group, there happens the osteoporosis. Hypogonadal stage, there is thyroid oxygenosis, GI disorders like celiac disease which causes malabsorption syndrome leading to less absorption of vitamin D, less absorption of calcium that leads to the malabsorption of these bone forming units. Hematological disorders like hemophilia, leukemia, lymphomas, Multiple myeloma in the latter age group, sickle cell disease, systemic mastocytosis, thalassemia, these are leading to the secondary osteoporosis. Similarly, rheumatological disorder where there is a steroids at the same time, autoimmune bone destruction, ankylosis spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE. On the other hand, some neurological diseases like epilepsy, like muscular dystrophy, these are leading to the weakness in the muscles and weakness in the bones leading to osteoporosis. HIV, amyloidosis, chronic metabolic acidosis, these are miscellaneous growth, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, there is liver disease, renal disease, all it is because we have already seen. That is why we are telling the secondary osteoporosis. The liver, kidney are important factors of development of the osteogenic osteoporosis or rather development of the vitamin D. So here lies the problem. So whenever there is problem in the kidney, problem in the liver, there will be chances of osteoporosis. Some medication, particularly aluminium, androgen, deprivation therapy, anticoagulants, anticonvulsants, barbiturates, cancer therapies, glucocorticoids, steroids, will come in detail of the steroid. Similarly, nitrotic cell, which is anti rheumatic drug, DMRD, parenteral nutrition, proton pump inhibitor, parenteral nutrition having sometimes compromisation in calcium and vitamin D. So, there lies a the problem. SSRI given in depression, tamoxifen given in breast cancer treatment, thiazolidin beyond given in as a diabetic medication. These all can lead to the secondary osteoporosis. So these are very common reuse medications like aluminium antacids, like thyroid replacement hormone, thiazolidin beyond, methotrexate, mostly used in different types of diseases can lead to the secondary osteoporosis. So drug genetic, lifestyle factors, systemic diseases, hormonal diseases. This can all lead to secondary osteoporosis. Some, some more and some less. But all of the contributory factors. Now comes the diagram which is the commonest areas of osteoporosis. 
Remember our child is smoking glucocorticoid, these are the area which is interrelated to each other as you know the remainder oxide is increases interleukin 1, interleukin 6, tumor chain of alpha and at the same time smoking increases parathormone, decreases parathormone, vitamin D also decreases by smoking on the other hand glucocorticoids increases rank ligand, increases decoblock and osteoblastic differentiation is reduced. So all these factors are contributed in to develop secondary osteoporosis. Now, how to diagnose osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a very neglected part from orthopedic as well as rheumatology point of view most of the time. We ignore osteoporosis. We used to give the medication for DM, for rheumatoid arthritis, for SLE, for all the other diseases we used to give for different factors, but we hardly give much credit rather to the osteoporosis and we used to uh, fail to take the histories. So, here you can see. The, these are the diagnostic things we need to investigate to diagnose osteoporosis. Mostly vitamin D, parathyroid, testosterone level sometimes, sometimes proteinectoporosis to rule out multiple myeloma, sometimes light chain to rule out multiple light chain myelomas, TSH, IgA level, iron, prolactin level, these are all the things that can find the secondary osteoporosis as well. So these are the tools to find out the secondary osteoporosis. <laughs> now we are coming to the main stage of our treatment that is the therapy. So what are the goal of therapy of osteoporosis? One is to prevent fragility, fracture. We have to prevent fracture, particularly when we are in areas. So these bones are very important, body bulk column, hip, uh, hand, particularly forearm in case of um, fall of old ages, these are very much vulnerable areas for the fracture. So to prevent our fragility fracture, we need to stabilize the bone mass, we need to relieve the symptoms, it causes pain. Osteoporosis causes bone pain, is non-specific and generalized. So we need to prevent fracture as well as the symptoms and we need to improve the patient's functional status and mobility. So these are the management goals of our osteoporosis. Now comes to one by one. These mm. are the medication in our armamentarium. What are they? One prevents bone resorption. We found in our previous study that there is two things. One is bone resorption, another is bone formation. So something which prevents their bone formation is a cause of osteoporosis. Similarly, some are increases bone resorption, which is again the cause of osteoporosis. So we have to eliminate the bone resorption. What are the drugs available? Denosumab, bisphosphonates, alendronate, adidronate, desidronate, calcitonin, nasal, estrogen, progestin in case of menopausal women, and selective estrogen react, receptor modulator or ranoxifen. These are mostly important in menopausal osteoporosis. It's not having a role in male patient. For the male patient, we will concentrate on the denosumab and bisphosphonate only in terms of inhibitors of bone resorption. On the other hand, the stimulation of bone formation and the parathyroid hormone analogs like cheriparatide, avaloparatide and ramosorunzumab and mixed which is having a good action, easily available and always given that is the vitamin D and its metabolites and calcium many of the times. So let's start one by one. First comes with bisphosphonate, the mostly used as it is quite economical, at the same time it should be given either weekly or monthly and particularly in case of Jolene once yearly. So it is abundant, it is used most frequently. But let's see how safe and how appropriate it is in different circumstances. So usually it's taken in the morning, the patient must stand or sit upright after taking and avoid any intake other than water for 30 minutes. It may not be possible in many patients. Because osteoporosis itself leads to multiple incidents of fracture, not only that, it can happen in mostly the patients who are debilitated. So very difficult for them to stand or sit upright for 30 minutes in many times. A stroke patient cannot sit in this way for 30 minutes. So here is a problem and that leads to the failure of adherence of this patient for the treatment. Or sometimes it happens, otherwise there is chances of esophagitis, chances of GI side effects. 
and this is the main culprit for the discontinuation of bisphosphonate many of the times. On the other hand, the recommendation is quite clear here. ACP recommends that the clinician use bisphosphonate for initial pharmacologic treatment to reduce the risk of fracture. It reduces the risk of fracture in postmenopausal female diagnosed with primary osteoporosis. Here, the recommendation is quite strong. On the other hand, the for pharmacological treatment to reduce risk of fracture in males, there is a low certainty evidence. It is strongly evident in case of postmenopausal female. On the other hand, for male, it's not so strong in terms of as a initial pharmacological treatment in a male having a risk of fracture. So, primary osteoporosis in both male and female is possible as the preferred first line of treatment. Mostly preferred drugs are alanzonate, zolindronate, and acetronate. On the other hand, evandronate having a lack of evidence in reducing hip fracture. So it is not so recommended as terms of in terms of other three drugs. So mostly used here is alanzonate followed by the zolindronate once yearly dose. Now let us see all the long term side effects. There is atypical femur fracture sometimes. These are not the classic fracture of osteoporosis. These are due to bisphosphonate problems and osteonecrosis of the jaw as well. Here is the, you can see the osteonecrosis. So, is it a good enough drug for osteoporosis? The oral bisphosphonate is alendronate, imandronate, hell esophageal disorder you cannot give, achalasia, esophageal stricture, esophageal varices, varied esophagus. Unfortunately, these different esophageal diseases may be undiagnosed. You hardly diagnose achalasia in an aged patient. You hardly diagnose esophageal varices in a patient who is sometimes back alcoholic and various esophagus as well. Until and unless you do an endoscopy, it is hardly difficult to diagnose by clinical means. So, there lies the problem. If we give the oral bisphosphonate in this patient, it can lead to catastrophe, it can lead to a rupture of the barrack, it can lead to the esophageal. That is after this In a way to follow the dosing requirements, as I have already mentioned, certain types of bariatric surgery where you cannot give, particularly rubo angular gastric bypass. And IV and oral bisphosphonate, the patients of chronic kidney disease, estimated GFL less than 30 to 35 ml per minute, you cannot give this drug because it is not renally safe, particularly in chronic kidney disease. Now, ACP3 recommendation. Here comes the lenozumab, moderate certainty evidence and recombinant ketiparatide or recombinant parathormone followed by bisphosphonate to reduce the risk of fracture only in females with primary osteoporosis with a very high risk of fracture. These are the conditional recommendations. Now comes the treatment with lenozumab or ketiparatide for 24 months. What the effect we found is a 74 year age or more having a primary osteoporosis, very high risk of fracture, old age, recent fracture, last 12 months, presence of multiple risk fractures, failure of other osteoporotic therapy. Here comes the role of recommendation of romosozumab and teriparatide or teriparatide. Discontinuation of anabolic agents like romosozumab and teriparatide can cause increased fracture risk and rapid bone loss should always be followed by anti-absorption therapy like this phosphorus. So here also, when we are discontinuing these two, we have to start bisphosphonate in this patient. Here lies again the problem. May these patients are bisphosphonate uh, intolerant or bisphosphonate cannot be given in this patient because of the above mentioned criteria like esophageal problems. So how can I restart? And on the other hand, if I give these two things in a patient for a longer period of time and then discontinue it because of its side effect or when their recommendation is not there, so it will cause rapid bone loss and ultimately there is a high fracture risk. So basically with giving early romosuzumab and teriparatide, we are inviting the patient to have to take this phosphonate. There is no other alternatives. Teriparatide increases withdrawal due to the adverse effect. Romosuzumab increases cardiovascular risk. So in these two things, when it comes during the use of this, we have to go to this bisphosphonate. There lies the problem of romosuzumab and teriparatide. Now, these are all time limited drugs. We cannot give this for a long period of time till our present data. 
Deriparatide, Avaloparatide, and Romosozumab. These are very young drugs. They have very less studies till date. And till then we get the information, we hardly give it for a long period of time. And after that, which is very interesting, we have to give bisphosphonate in those patients. Now, some special population. In case of renal patients, this clearance, we either have to stop or we have to dose modification. We need to do at cancer patient, there is bone metastasis in these patients. We cannot use this drugs like tetiparamide. Now here are the different recommendations. In case of hip fracture, there is bisphosphonate versus placebo trial, nerosumab versus placebo trial. Here the Martin Wall fracture more than 35, 36 months, bisphosphonate versus placebo trial, nerosumab versus placebo trial. Sometimes it withdraws due to adverse effects. But evidence are very uncertain, which is most important. Evidence is very uncertain about the denosumab and evidence are not available in other treatments as well here. Now, we are going for our main draft today. So, ACB study the clinician take individual approach regarding the way that to start pharmacological treatment with a bisphosphonate in case of female over the age of 65 years with low bone mass or osteopenia and to reduce the risk of fracture there is conditional recommendation with loose heart and evidence so additional what are the criteria what are the things we can use we can use calcium we can use vitamin d for calcium it needs to be 1000 mg per day LLD and 1200 in case of more than 70 years vitamin d 600 unit per day international unit per day for 70 years and 800 unit per day in the case of 70 years and above Assessment of baseline every time the bone density like NASA scanning, previous history of fracture, response to previous therapy of osteoporosis and presence of multiple risk factors of fracture I have already discussed. So duration of bisphosphonate therapy I have mentioned is limited to 5 years and temporary bisphosphonate discontinuation should be there. Prolonged therapy of bisphosphonate reduces the risk of vertebral fracture and significantly increases the long term adverse effects as well. Female patients who received anabolic steroids should be given anti-resorptive agents to maintain benefits and avoid the risk of rebound and multiple body ball fracture I have mentioned. In case of elderly more than 65, the treatment is necessary for considering polypharmacy and resultant drug-drug interaction and comorbidity and other ongoing medication should be always considered while planning osteoporosis treatment. And in case of secondary osteoporosis, his history is very important. Gonadectomy and sex steroids should be considered while discussing osteoporosis treatment. Now, glucocorticoids is a special mention here. You can see the glucocorticoids stimulates rank, and there is problems in case of in terms of hypothalamus pituitary axis. There is some MCSF macrophage colony stimulating factor aggravation, glucocorticoid dependent protein that leads to the mRNA one. Collagen S3 and bone matrix protein breakdown. So, here glucocorticoid increases the chances of osteoporosis. 2022, there is a latest recommendation for American College of Rheumatology guideline with the prevention and treatment of glucocorticoid therapy. Mild osteoporotic fracture, less than 40, more than 40 years, non traumatic pathological fractures. We can continue. Less than 40 non traumatic pathological fracture, we can continue. Clinical assessment, history of GCUs, evaluation for fall fracture, frac scoring, BMD should be done, and GC dose, if more than 7.5, multiple 10 years, the risk of major osteoporotic fracture is very high 1.15 to 1.2. So, if we use glucocorticoid more than 7.5 mg in terms of prednisolone, and for a 10 years duration, there are high chance of fracture in the patients. So, fracture risk categories in patients not yet receiving glucocorticoid therapy is much less as compared to who receiving glucocorticoid therapy. Now, the recommendation of ph pharmacological treatment, I am coming to the denosumab last. So, let's see the others. Calcium, along 
with lifestyle modification, diet with supplementation, and I have already mentioned the calcium should be 1000 in a less than 70 year patient and 1200 in case of more than 70 years. Similarly, vitamin D up to 600 international unit for those who are less than 70 years and more than 800 international unit per day when they are more than 70 years. Bisphosphonate, allantonate, acetonate, evantonate, zolantonate, strongly recommended in a fracture, high risk of fracture patients. Teriparatide, avaloparatide, they are conditionally recommended. Anti rank due to CVT and thrombosis risk, unless first line therapies are contraindicated or retroviral will start. And this ACRM and anti serotonin, these are used. In particular, these are used in menopausal osteoporosis. There is significantly there is no mention of the calcitonin in this particular group. Sequential treatment recommendation: first oral or IV bisphosphonate, then ACRM, then parathormone, then lenalidomide or rosuzumab. The sequential treatment recommended. We usually not prefer dual therapy. We cannot use bisphosphonate and lenalidomide simultaneously. Similarly, we cannot use teriparatide and bisphosphonate or denosumab simultaneously, though their duration of treatment differs. Denosumab given every six monthly and bisphosphonate given every weekly, sometimes every year, sometimes even. We cannot use this together. We used to prefer sequential therapy. This is not like the MRDs. We can use four or five at a time to prevent inflammation. It is not there. There is no benefit found in simultaneously use of bisphosphonate and denosumab or bisphosphonate or teriparatide or teriparatide and denosumab like this. Now, calcitonin. Calcitonin is a not so recommended drug but is used in menopausal osteoporosis. There is block bone resorption but cannot stimulate bone growth. It prevents bone resorption but cannot stimulate bone growth. Do not have any protective role or hip fracture. Cause distressing menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, leg cramps. Cause swelling in the legs and deep vein thrombosis. These are the adverse events. That is why calcitonin is no more recommended as an osteoporotic basket. Now, let us map. The drug which have a balance, efficacy, safety, compliance and cost. So recommendation is a land regain denosumab as a second line pharmacology treatment to reduce the risk of fractures in postmenopausal females diagnosed with primary osteoporosis. But here lies the fact that it is not yet recommended as a primary but is a contraindication of adverse effects of bisphosphonate. So bisphosphonate is the first drug of choice till date. Only it is given denosumab only when there is contraindication of bisphosphonate to some extent, but there is many contraindication actually for bisphosphonates. Denosumab is the only available rank ligand inhibitor which is reduces the risk of any clinical and radiographic fracture when used at least three years. It also probably reduces the risk of radiographic particular fracture shorter follow-up duration. So in 1 to 3 years only, when we are giving only 2 to 3 doses only, we are used to give denosumab in a 6 monthly dose. So 1 year means 2 dose and 3 years means 6 dose. Even in 1 to 3 years, we will find it probably reduces the radiographic particle fracture. Similar to this phosphorus, there is increased risk of AFA by ONG. Anti-resorptives. Anabolics we have already seen. Now it's a fully humoral monoclonal antibody. It's an IgG isotype. It's a high affinity and specificity of human rank ligand. I have already seen that the rank molecule having an important area of bone resorption and rank facilitates bone resorption. So it acts, it has a high affinity and specificity of the human rank ligand and it has an anti resorptive activity. Here you can see in a quite diagrammatic way, here comes the perfusion, uh, perfusion of the osteoclast, 
multinucleated osteoclast is here, activated osteoclast and here is a role of rank. These are the rank, so it helps in binding with the osteoclast and that leads to the bone resorption. So it helps actually, rank actually helps to bind osteoclast with the bones and facilitate bone resorption. So by inhibiting rank, Delosuma prevents osteoclastic activity at the same time osteoporotic activity or bone resorption. This is the inhibition, osteoclast formation, function and survival all are inhibited by rank ligand inhibitor that is denosumab. Osteoclast formation, function as well as survival. So now approved indication, I have already mentioned in the United States approved in 2010 in postmenopausal osteoporosis. In 13 June, US FDA approved denosumab in treatment of adults and skeletally mature adolescents with giant cell tumor that is unresectable or where resection would result a significant morbidity. And May 2018 is given permission for glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis as well. In India, it is recommended as a use in postmenopausal osteoporosis with a high risk of fracture and to increase bone mass in men in case of senile osteoporosis. So in United States, a stepwise recommendation in 2010 is for postmenopausal osteoporosis, 13 is for the all adolescents with a giant cell tumor and in 18 is glucocorticoid in this osteoporosis. So dose is 60 mg every 6 months in a subcutaneous injection, side preferable is upper arm, upper thigh or abdomen, patients to take calcium 1000 daily and at least 400 international unit vitamin D every day along with denosumab 6 months in therapy. What are the contraindications of denosumab? Hypocalcemia, pregnancy and known hypersensitivity to denosumab itself. Here the serious events, you can see 5 years there is some infection, cellulitis, malignancy, osteonecrosis is nil, atypical fracture is nil. This is the advantage of denosumab as compared to other bisphosphonates and all those. So effect you can see <coughs> is quite high reduction of vertebral and non-vertebral fracture as well as hip fracture is quite high in case of placebo and comparatively low in case of denosumab. Change in BMD you can see the change is almost 9.2% bone mass density in lumbar spine and 6% in case of hip. It increases bone mineral density. Is another study is extended up to 10 years, where you can see 66% patient completed in the study. So the chances of adverse event is less. So during choice of a drug, we always find two things: one is efficacy and another is safety. So here we are finding the bisphosphonate is a good drug. Bisphosphonate is till date as an initial therapy recommended by every osteoporotic bodies so called. But here lies the different adverse effects of bisphosphonate. On the other hand, denosumab having almost minimal adverse effects and quite tolerability that is recommended and also the study has done up to 10 years and in case of those patients, the patient population is important to us. Like in a in an area where we are dealing the osteoporosis, osteoporosis hardly happens below 60 years until and unless we are thinking about some genetic or congenital diseases. It hardly happens before 60 years of age. So when the patient is more than 60, sometimes 70, 80, these patients are not only suffering from osteoporosis, osteoporopenia, they are suffering from so many diseases itself. Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease, uh, asthma, COPD, chronic alcoholism, liver failure, everything can be there. And on that aspect, giving a bisphosphonate, also cancer, malignancy. Malignancy is almost a contraindication of zolimnodia and uh, bisphosphonate until and unless it's given as a bone metastatic therapy in terms of zolimnodic acid. So otherwise, it's very difficult to choice bisphosphonate in a patient in this short of picture 
having a multiple comorbidities. On the other hand, tenosumab is very effective, though it is recommended that when bisphosphonate is contraindicated, but the contraindicated area or side effect, adverse effect area is much more in terms of bisphosphonate as compared to the tenosumab. So, 10 years genosumab treatment in case of postmenopausal women with osteoporosis has shown that data of 2626 patient treatment for 10 years, there is low rates of adverse events, this is very important, low fracture incidence and continued increase in BMW, AVMD without treatment. So, 21.7 to 9.2 cumulative increases in LS BMD and total hip BMD respectively. So, bone mineral density in two areas, two weight bearing areas. Lambosacral spine and hip is increases. One is very significant that is lambosacral spine and also 9.2% in case of hip. And for a long study, two years duration study, here lumbar spine, total hip, femoral leg, and radius all are taken care of. And there is a change in BMD in all critical sites. So significant change in reabsorption, more good as well. And here study is the like 2 years. So same in osteoporotic renal impairment as well. No dose adjustment required in patient with stage 4, up to stage 4. Renal function has no significant impact on pharmacokinetics and dynamics of tenosumab. Here also difference from the bisphosphonates. Because bisphosphonate cannot be given when the creatine clearance is less than 30. Therapy adherence. Obviously, as six monthly doses, as there is no adjustment of food, 30 minutes, standing, sitting, all those things, different esophageal problems, etc. So, chances of adherence and only six monthly therapy, chances of adherence is very high. It's just like an insulin therapy in a six month interval. A needle subcutaneous needle which hardly gives any pain is to be given in a patient every six months. Any patient, there is probably no patient if the financial constant is not there, is unwilling to take this medicine. Everybody will prefer this drug in terms of its compliance. So, effect of denosumab and allen donated in BMD. You can see the denosumab increased BMD in all critical areas, while allen donated had variable response. In lumbar spine, you can see there is variable response. Here is almost parallel response, alternate radius, but here is again different response in terms of femoral leg. You can see the everywhere the denosumab graph is going up. On the other hand, allen loaded graph going down in case of femoral leg, giving a steady line in case of lumbar spine, though it's quite parallel in case of radius. Patient previously treated with oral BPs, denosumab versus jorinotic acid. The BP is here bisphosphonate. So now, previously treated bisphosphonate. Now, what is our choice? Whether to take denosumab or to take jorinotic acid. Here you can see the responses of denosumab is quite high as compared to jorinotic acid in all the vulnerable areas like lumbar spine is very high, total heat is high. Femoral leg is high at least in one third of the radius. So here is a statistically significant denosumab increase of BM, bone mineral density, significantly more than the zolintonic acid IV given in the sites. Also, the IV giving zolintonic acid is much more difficult as compared to subcutaneous therapy of denosumab. So denosumab compared to bisphosphonate, we have already proved superior efficacy, better safety profile, better compliance, and improves BMD at all critical sites and compared to tetiparatide it has a long term safety safe in hyperparathyroid patient patient with compromised renal function and cancer patients in all these area where the bisphosphonate and tetiparatide fail denosumab has a superior efficacy compared to this drug so now comes the latest recommendation of postmenopausal osteoporosis treatment algorithm so, lumbar spine or femoral leg, if the T-score is less than minus 2.5 with a history of isolated fracture, high fat scoring, evaluate for secondary osteoporosis, we have mentioned the battery of investigation is to do. Then correct calcium and vitamin D deficiency and address cause of secondary osteoporosis. 
we have to treat the secondary osteoporosis maybe hormonal maybe malabsorption syndrome we need to treat it in a separate way now if we consider the primary then recommend pharmacological therapy lifestyle fall prevention benefit and risk of medication with high risk or no prior fracture high risk no prior fracture they are allen donate denosumab resin donate jolent donate all are there alternate therapy is also there then they get reassess for after one year for the therapy and fracture is increasing or stable bmd with no fracture drug holiday for five years with oral or three years iv is postponed here denosumab is not recommended if there is stable bmd resume therapy with fracture occurs bmd declines below then we have to consider either bisphosphonate or denosumab here the progression of bone loss then we need to reassess again we need to give some different drugs like injectable to find the response to oral therapy and switch to avaloperidide, romosuzumab, teriparidide we already we use these two drugs alendronate and denosumab we already use then failed and then we can use these two on the other hand if the very high risk of fracture we again we can use avaloperidide, denosumab, romosuzumab here only zolendronate and the bisphosphonate no role of alendronate, desendronate there only Zolent donate can be used when there is a high risk of fracture. Then reassess the therapy, either denosumab, continue the therapy, romosumab for one year sequential therapy, avaloperidide, after two years sequential therapy, zolent donate if stable, continue therapy every year for six years. If the progression of bone loss, recurrent fractures, consider switching to avaloperidide or teriparidide or romosuzumab. From zolent donate, we hardly can find a place for denosumab after zolendronic acid initiation. So, what we can understand from our present, let's see the recommendation only. So, what we can understand, we can find two options here for initiation of therapy. One is this possible which is oral, that is weekly, or denosumab every six monthly. In this area, we have to assess the patient in terms of its side effects, in terms of its financial condition, and we have, we have significant data behind us to support we can give both these two, either or, in terms of its medicine demerits. We spot was postponed, though recommended in most of the areas as a primary therapy, but denosumab can be given as a primary therapy because contraindication is very high in these patients. And this patient we are dealing with mostly aged patients. So its side effect needs to be taken care of. So either or we can use at a time and it's found that in this primary treatment therapy or starting therapy, denosumab is much superior in terms of its efficacy as well as safety and the 10 years data is available. On the other hand, when there is a high risk of fracture, we have to consider either zolendronate, that is an injectable bisphosphonate, or avaloperidide or teriparidide but when the patient is stable we can have a drug holiday maybe one year or two year we can engage go to denosumab but not in case of zolendronic acid when zolendronic acid is given and there is still progressive deterioration of the symptoms we cannot go to the denosumab so denosumab almost coming as a primary therapy of osteoporosis in a patient which is a six month therapy which is a subcutaneous therapy which is quite effective with minimal side effect. So the days are coming when we will get a strong recommendation as well from the different bodies of osteoporosis that these two can be given in a similar way and maybe either or way but we cannot give combination therapy at least till date there is no role of combination therapy in terms of osteoporosis. Thank you. Any question? <coughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Sir, can you go in here? Huh? 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 Hu
because the osteoporosis happens in subcondylar bone in rheumatoid so i think denosumab um, can help uh, because it is a link ligand and in rheumatoid arthritis there is increase in interleukin 1 and 6 right so if i can prevent this to area we can have a role in anti resorptive effect can be a good option particularly relief of the pain and, and in many of the ra patient there will be osteoporosis of yeah the definitely Particularly aged patient, you are a elderly onset rheumatoid. There is high chance of osteoporosis because both because of glucocorticoid therapy as well as because of the with a sub um, epi epicardial bone resorption, subcondylar bone resorption. As a as a rheumatologist for patients' point of view, what are the challenges you face while prescribing? Only financial, frankly speaking, no other. Only it's costly, and at a time we have to pay. Only thing is. Otherwise, if you divide one for it, the cost is not that. Otherwise, total cost will be around 